Thanks for the invitation and the introduction. Um, and I know it's, uh, you've had a long day of uh, presentations, uh, although there were some interruptions, but I will try to make this as um, uh, visual as, uh, as possible, what I want to, want to be talking about today, which hopefully should lighten you for the end of the day, because uh, of course I'm the one who stands between you and dinner, and, uh, and so this, uh, I, I'm quite aware of the responsibility that brings with it. Um, but uh, it's not a frivolous uh, use of visuals, but it's actually very much what I want to talk about today. Um, because what I want to talk about is um, nation branding and nation building. Now, there's been a lot of interest in nation branding in recent years, and there are manuals on how countries and places and companies brand themselves. And of course, it's a literature which comes from business uh, in, in microeconomics. Um, about how, well, of course, first brands are commercial products, but how this has been transferred to uh, places which are not directly sold uh, in terms of physically being sold, but of course marketed. Um, this is a very, a very straightforward exercise. The idea that uh, any place can be like Coca-Cola or any product and could be packaged and sold like that. But I think where this whole thing gets interesting is, of course, when social scientists uh, start looking at this topic and start wondering what that means. So there's been some interest and some research on um, nation branding by social scientists in recent years, or I would say over the last uh, nearly 10 years, scholars have looked at that uh, and have looked at that also for, for Southeastern Europe. And I will reflect some of that scholarship in my talk today. Um, well, I think uh, what I would like to, to, to argue here is, well, is that it's productive to think about it um, as a way, analytical way, to understand nationalism. Uh, nationalism studies over the last decades has been focused a lot on the origins of nation building and has focused a lot on official state policies, monuments, street names, textbooks, uh, and all of those tools. But um, that is not to be said that this is not relevant, but I think there's more to it. Um, there's, of course, a lot of research, anthropological research, which looks at grassroots and bottom-up in terms of how citizens respond or don't respond to the state imposition of identities, national identities, or otherwise. But there is this commercial side. There is this side of selling the nation, which I think is quite important, and which makes us understand maybe some elements of nation-building differently. What I will argue is not that this is a replacement of nation building or that this is something detached from nation building, but this is actually a site of nation building where nation building is negotiated in a global marketplace and in fact also where, it asks, where it's forced to ask itself the question of how a particular narrative is sold. So, um, and I'm not arguing that this is a straightforward relationship, but that this is a complicated relationship and one which uh, is not, uh, not without its tensions inherently built into it. Um, and I will look at a number, I will give you a kind of, put it in the context of the post-Yugoslav space, but particularly look at, um, at the case of Macedonia, not because it is unique, but because it is particularly pronounced for some of the features we're going to be looking at. And in fact, if you've traveled to, to Macedonia uh, recently, you will always, when you arrive at the airport of Alexander the Great, get a message on your, uh, on your telephone. Uh, an SMS, which I just got a few days ago. Fortunately, I deleted it. I should have kept it for the... But it, it, I, I know it by heart by now. So it basically starts saying, you know, welcome to the cradle of civilization. Um, we, uh, while you're here in Macedonia, we recommend you visit the Museum of the Macedonian Struggle. It doesn't give the full name, which is a... Because, you know, there are only so many characters in an SMS, and the, the museum name exceeds uh, at, at least five SMSs by the length of it, because it's the Macedonian struggle for independence, the revolution, uh, the, 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 the um, anti, uh, well, the communist crimes, and the Bemoro. So, you know, and if you spell Bemoro, then really you will need quite a few text messages. Uh, it also recommends you to visit, of course, the house of Mother Teresa uh, and a few other sites, which if you go to Macedonia, I ask you to ignore all of those recommendations. But um, it's a particularly pronounced case of this, but it's not, uh, it's not unique, as you'll see. Um, the tension I want to kind of bring out here is, is uh, taken out from two uh, tourist uh, materials. Um, one is from the Macedonian uh, campaign called Timeless, which is the current Macedonian tourist campaign, which says, two, two true folklore cannot be bought or sold. It has to be learned through toil, sweat, tears, and sometimes even blood. Contrary to 
someone who abuses its name for self-serving interest and is not a mere entertainment to amuse uh, the throngs or to pander to an audience. Now this is a pretty heavy message for a tourist uh, slogan, you know, you have to earn it through your, your blood potentially, you can't just buy it. Um, here is the Croatian counterpart. Uh, the Buy Croatia concept um, implies arrangements of business meetings between Croatian tourist participants and foreign tourist uh, participants. So bringing together those and then you sell Croatia. Much more pragmatic approach, no blood, sweat and tears involved in this particular process. But what is implied in this is this tense relationship between the idea that national heritage is something uh, not to be sold, something which is uh, protected, which you cannot commodify, um, and of course the demands on the other side of a global marketplace of exactly that commodification. So I think those two quotes don't reflect different policies, but they reflect the fundamental dilemma of nation branding, that it's about selling a product which in its self-perception cannot be sold. Uh, and there's, I think, a tension which we find uh, in, this particular, in this particular dynamic. So, now, as I've already said, uh, one of the key reasons why I think this is a, a, a fruitful you know, site of research is that, you know, we, we look at constitutions, we look at flags, we look at symbols, we look at all of those official ways in which states present themselves. Uh, but we ignore very often tourism or nation branding as part of that. Um, and I think this is for two reasons. One of all is, is in a certain way one takes the state too seriously in its self-perception that it sees the only serious way in which we present ourselves is the constitution. This is you know, where statesmen invest a lot of energy. But at the same time, how many people know their constitution? How many people actually read their preamble of their constitution? Uh, you know, a few crazy researchers do that, but many people don't do it. How many people go and look at monuments? I mean, except for Vera Pavlakovic and a few other people who, who are, you know, very, very well document them, but, but, you know, most of us walk past them. And I remember walking through Graz with, uh, with Benedict Anderson a few years ago, and this was exactly, we looked at some monuments, and he said, you know, listen, we're just, you know, it's us historians um, looking at these monuments, but most people walk past them, they ignore them. Um, you know, and then there's a monument to, I don't know, all kinds of different battles, and you know, you might aesthetically uh, engage with them, but most of the time you don't even know what they particularly celebrate, unless they are particularly provocative or, or, or obvious. Um, again, I'm not saying that these are not useful places to research, I'm just saying that there are other ones which are not taken as serious. And I think other scholars have observed that tourism, uh, historically, in, in, in scholarship, has often not been taken seriously. Because, I mean, this has changed, of course, in the last couple of decades where we see development of serious research on tourism um, and nation branding as part of that. But uh, outside of, especially if you go, you know, in history, actually, this is one of the first disciplines which has been looking at tourism. And, uh, you know, of course, Igor, Igor has, been, has been doing that himself in the case of Yugoslavia a lot. Um, but um, in terms of other disciplines, very few people look at it. Um, anthropologists look at it. But, for example, political scientists don't take it seriously at all because it is something kind of seen as frivolous and, you know, this is fun, you know, how can it be a serious uh, area of research if it's fun, you know, it's not, it's not diplomats, it's not embassies, it's not foreign ministers negotiating, so how can this be a serious uh, place of research? And I think this is, of course, the fundamental misunderstanding that just because people might enjoy their holidays or tourism, that it doesn't mean it's not a meaningful place of research um, uh, and that uh, people invest meaning in it and, and it has, uh, it has, a, um, it has a value to research. So, um, this is why I think it's good to push in this direction and also in disciplines which might have not embraced it in the same way. Now, it's of course the way in which a country sells itself matters um, for the outside world. It matters for the country's position in the outside world, maybe even more than what classical you know, international relations scholars might look at when they look at international relations and kind of diplomacy, at least in everyday life. Yes, in moments of crisis, foreign ministers might matter more than tourist agencies, but in the everyday life of international relations, often, I would argue, this perception mediated through uh, global media and tourism industries matter uh, at least as much. Um, and it's the other one element is, is the internal one, which I also would like to make, is that while nation branding, for the most part, is directed to the outside, 
if you observe debates in the countries, you realize that these are fundamentally internalized. These are not just about how we sell ourselves to the outside, but they're very much part of, well, what does it mean that we sell ourselves like that to the outside? There's contestation, there is challenges to it, and there's certainly also, as I would argue in the end, a way in which that external, the, the, the way one presents oneself to the outside has also a certain consequence for imposing a particular dominant narrative towards the inside. Um, now, if you, look at the, if you look at that kind of idea of, of, of branding nations, I mean, again, branding nations is the idea that you create a, a recognition of a particular brand, a particular product, um, which people will associate with particular content, a uh, positive one, you will hope. So, if you, look at the, if you look at the kind of way in which these terms interrelate in, the, in Southeastern Europe, so we have the first one is the, the brand recognition for startup nations, right? This, so this has been, I think, one of the key motivators, and this is why it's interesting to look at the post-Yugoslav states, because uh, there was this intrinsic idea of promoting one's existence. It wasn't just a tourist project, but it's a project to, to uh, alert the world to one's existence, which of course, you know, let's say Austria or, or, or Germany or other countries don't have the need to do because it's about filling the, the perceived knowledge of the existence with meaning or changing that meaning, but not about the first point, it's about saying we are there. Um, and so you have even campaigns uh, like the Kosovo Young European campaign, uh, which um, basically uh, is, doesn't even ask people to visit it. Right? The point is not to convince people to visit Kosovo. The message is we, are, we exist. And in fact, we're kind of pretty cool and we're young and we're European. Um, this is, the, the, so this is not, the message is not, and this is interesting, most tourist uh, ads, and I'll show some to you, are about showing how we're different from where you are. Right? They're not telling you we look the same like where you are because for a tourism concept that's utterly destructive, right? To say, it's exactly here, the same way here as where you come from. So, you know, why come? Right? But the, the Young European Campaign of Kosovo, which was again all about nation building and state building after 2008, was exactly about showing we look just like you. We're not scary terrorists, you know, we don't, uh, we don't dress up in Uchika uniforms or are drug dealers, but we're just young, hip Europeans. Um, so again, not a tourist. Uh, the second point is that, of course, as I've already implied with that, that a lot of this nation branding is not just about tourism, it's also about positioning oneself for public investment, uh, for foreign investment. Uh, so you have all kinds of campaigns for investment. So for example, Macedonia has had a very, a very uh, strong, expensive campaign in recent years about uh, attracting foreign investment, not with much success, but again, promoting the idea of being business friendly. You can start a business in Macedonia in hours, you know, or in days at least, and all of that. Um, or public diplomacy, as the case of Kosovo, as I've talked about. They, in terms of their content, and we'll, uh, I'll show you some, uh, they do two things. They counter and they confirm Balkanist stereotypes. Um, they are very often uh, using the repertoire of Balkans as a metaphor or kind of the, the pe perceptions people have, sometimes to exactly tell you that's exactly who we are, and sometimes to say, well, that's not who we are, um, kind of moving beyond it. Um, and again, I think in the internal side, it does three things. It's first of all, you know, kind of creates or recreates, reaffirms uh, the, the community, the imagined community. It says, you know, this is who we are, because again, Although nation branding, again, is actually a confusing term because it, it replicates the uh, English ambiguity about what nation means, whether it means state or, 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 or actually in, in a community of citizens or who identify with the nation. But again, all of these campaigns are based on nation states, or in states, I should say, but project a particular national content on them. They're not saying, you know, this is the Republic of Serbia or the Republic of Croatia, and we are like, you know, they, they, don't identify the, they don't identify the state in civic. They might identify it in multi-ethnic or diverse, but certainly not in civic terms or in kind of abstract not notions of citizenship. The citizen is not a player in nation brand, uh, because again, that's too abstract of a concept. Uh, and you know, certainly one can see nation branding as an exercise in banal nationalism, uh, in the sense that it is this, creates these very banal symbols, which you can argue are, um, 
benign, and some of the scholars of nation branding tend to look at nation branding as a benign uh, project because it doesn't say, you know, come here, we, we hate others, or, you know, it, inherently it has to take a positive view of diversity again because it's trying to get foreign visitors to come, so it inherently cannot be exclusionary uh, in a way. But uh, I think that is, of course, a naive way of looking at it because it has other ways of being exclusionary, it has other ways of projecting a particular way of way the country works, which can be very much reaffirming conventional nationalism. But it is all about, and I think this is one of the key points I would like to make, it's all about making the local national compatible with the global or European. So it's about saying, you know, our nation, our nation state fits very well into the global scene. Right. It's not, you know, it's trying to project this idea that one's own nation, national narrative, nation brand is compatible, right? That you can sell your nation to the outside world. Thus, it fits it. Um, now, of course, this, the, the terminology might be new because the concept of nation branding is something which is maybe 20, 30 years old. But of course, nation branding has existed earlier, or, or country branding, right? So you can look at. Uh, and I think this is an, an, an important point which I'd like to make. If you look at the, the Adriatic, for example, uh, you have domestic nation branding, or not nation branding, but tourist branding, uh, going back into the 19th century. Um, and what I want to point out here is that these processes often have um, domestic functions. So if you look at the rise of tourism, the first wave of tourism uh, was very often, and, and the subsequent promotion of it, was not so much towards the outside but towards the inside, convincing one's citizens to travel within one's own country. So the first wave of nation branding, so to speak, was domestic nation branding rather than external nation branding. Um, now, of course, if you take a country uh, like Austria-Hungary, this was never possible because there was no nation to brand in the kind of modern sense of a nation. So, if you look at, for example, the way in which Austria-Hungary tried to brand the Adriatic in the 19th century, um, it could brand it as two things uh, domestically. One is being exotic. So, if you look at, for example, uh, down to the bottom right is a picture from the, uh, from the Adriatic exhibition which was held at Adria Ausstellung in 1913 in Vienna, uh, which was actually organized by the Ministry of War, but which was a kind of a tourism showcase of the, of the, of the Adriatic where they rebuilt uh, a number of you know, miniature Dubrovnik and other sites, but the whole point there was to make it exotic. Uh, and you know, you have like Dalmatians uh, dancing in, in folk costume there. So this was not about showing how similar it is, but how exotic, the exoticism within their own empire. So it was not about creating one nation, but actually creating difference within. Um, or it was importing external terms of uh, the luxurious. So the term Riviera was used, which was already in, in use in France for the, for the Côte d'Azur, or Madeira, which was used for the island of Foire, to say, you know, this is the, the Austro-Hungarian Madeira. So again, it creates certain visual images uh, which evoke luxury and so on. And um, this is, in a certain way, I just want to make this, the, the point that, uh, which Graham Robb makes in his book, The Discovery of France, where he argues extensively that the construction of infrastructure and of tourism was an essential tool of nation building in the 19th and 20th century in France. And again, it was about domestic nation building and domestic nation branding. It was about convincing the French that they should travel in France to discover their own nation. So this is why I would like to mention this because I, I would argue that today's nation branding is merely part of that history, just that it transfers the internal to the external because again, travel today is more about crossing borders than travel within countries. Um, so on the left here, there you see one of those posters which were popular in France to promote uh, where to go. And again, it both has the exotic, you know, the people in traditional costume, which allures people, but always emphasizing that this is, of course, France. Um, in, uh, in Yugoslavia, and then again, I, you know, I, I wouldn't want to talk much about this here, um, because you know, we have people in the room who have more to say about this. But of course, they had these two strands. Of on one side, um, 
building, nation building, Yugoslav state building and nation building through travel within Yugoslavia, so by creating mobility within it. And the, but it's a different process than the kind of process described in France in the 19th century, where it was very much about elites <coughs> traveling from Paris, from the capital, to the provinces. Right? This was a one-way process, where the idea was the elites, the emerging bourgeoisie, the middle classes, discover the country and become French by traveling. It was not so much about the people from the provinces to travel. While in socialist Yugoslavia, it was certainly much more uh, intersecting of also getting the people who had never traveled before to start moving and doing these things which they were hoping to would create some identity. But of course, then there was, there was the beginning of nation branding um, externally uh, by selling Yugoslavia to the outside world. Uh, and you know, there's a, a headline from, from uh, Vecha Milis from 1988 as Yugoslavia as a fashion hit, which you know, uh, was the perception at the time. The idea was, again, that tourism was not just a source of revenue, but it was a way to brand Yugoslavia, right? So there was a fundamental importance about, uh, in, embedded in the idea that this was not just about, this was about the image, this was reinforcing uh, the image of an open country uh, which, was, which was engaged with the West. Um, it became also, and I think we'll come back to that when I come to the case of Macedonia, and I just want to mention that, um, it becomes an obsession also, it becomes also a tool of internal discipline. Um, so you have regularly in Yugoslav media these articles about what do foreign tourists think about us? Uh, and they usually they usually say nothing but the worst, you know, they usually say, you know, this is, uh, this is from yesterday, from 1978, that we are, you know, badly informed, unfriendly, and hostile, and so on. And again, it's all about the idea, and it's, it's about the state educating its citizens. So it's, it's also interesting because it's not just about tourism functioning as a tool for domestic nation, nation building and uh, external nation branding, but it's also about, it's about disciplining one's own population about molding one's own population in a way which is desirable. And you'll recognize that when I come to something else later on. The other one, the cartoon on the right, is a little bit harder to read there. It's from Politica from 1976, and it says, uh, the tourism season says, uh, wake up, uh, wake up, it's, uh, soon it's fall, and you have to get ready for all the conferences, uh, statements, and uh, resolutions um, of, the, of the current season. Uh, and the idea was, of course, that you know, actually tourism is not doing much, but then afterwards there's all this analysis. And if you look at Yugoslav newspapers of that period, everywhere there's long statistics of exact analysis of how many people came across the border, what that means. And of course, you know, if you read creation newspapers every summer, they have exactly the same kind of reporting. It's still very much, uh, very much there. Um, so now going to the, to the post Yugoslav. So again, up in the post Yugoslav period, all of the, the, the successive states sought to brand themselves, um, again, as startup nations and have adopted multiple slogans. So we have, in the case of Slovenia, at first the green piece of Europe, which then became I, lo I feel love or I feel Slovenia. Um, Croatia, of course, you know, you know the slogan, small country for a great holiday or the Mediterranean as it once was. I think it's being replaced by something else now, I was told. Uh, Full of life. Full of life, yes, which of course, again, all of these are so meaningful, right? So, you know, you, you really know where you Then the Serbia landscape, it painted from the heart, was one. Montenegro, the ecological state, although that's been dropped because that, uh, you know, kind of really is not that plausible anymore. Uh, while beauty um, is maybe more plausible and Macedonia, timeless. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I would, I mean, I think you probably have seen some of them. I would like to show you some of them to give you a little bit of a, of a feel for, for the for these particular ones. I'll come back to Macedonia, uh, uh, but let me start with Slovenia.
there are certain themes which I will not show you this, the creation one because I presume many of you have seen this already. They have certain recurring themes. Um, they all have, if there are beaches available, then there are beaches, of course, involved in the, in the clip. Uh, they have old cities uh, and, uh, and some kind of vague ethno music, basically. That's kind of the generic uh, pattern of all of them. Um, the Montenegrin one is unusual in the sense it's the only one which has kind of more references to modern, uh, you know, kind of style, but mostly so, I mean, there's a whole discussion that you can have, I think, from a gender perspective looking at the videos, but I will not, I will not go, there, go there now, but I'll just note that. Um, so there's this, um, th there's these very, very kind of reoccurring themes uh, you find in these, in these clips, which, you know, in fact, if you position yourself not as somebody who, uh, as most of you are, from, from, from this particular region, uh, as somebody who's never heard anything, you probably wouldn't be able to tell which country is what, right? Or, you know, if you think, if you added away the names at the end, uh, Montenegro, for example, I mean, of course, if you've been to Montenegro, you will recognize, you know, Perast or some of the places, but uh, the Boko Kotoska, but you will, you know, you wouldn't notice this if you were, hadn't been there. So there isn't, it's in a certain way, and this is something I'll come back to, there's the, the kind of curious, the curious similarity of many of these presentations. Um, there's also, and I think this is the point I've made earlier, is that many of them actually there's some kind of what I call a feedback loop. So these video clips are usually discussed in the media, shown in the media domestically. So they're not just, of course, they are shown on CNN or international global news stations or online, but they are also part of domestic debates. Uh, in fact, a kind of curious example to share with you is the case of Serbia, which was this was his first big um, tourist spot <laughs> ten years ago. Not the whole purpose is, and this is again one of those tensions you find in the presentations between positioning oneself as European and uh, being, a, being a scandal that one could be that the music could be Kazakh is of course something which is embarrassing. But at the same time, one still wants to be exotic. So it's this kind of trying to be exotic and European. The other scandal was that this picture there, um, one of the clip, the clip you might notice is a, is a monastery which is actually it's on the Danube, but it's actually in Romania. Uh, so there was the whole scandal that how do, how can it be that we have uh, we have uh, a tourist clip of Serbia and we're actually advertising something in Romania? Uh, don't we have enough monasteries uh, of our of our own um, to promote? Uh, and so so this this created quite a quite a stir. But again, it shows you that these are their feedback loops. These are not just kind of external processes. Um, now. If you look at some of the people who've been writing about about national identity and nation branding, some of them have argued that I mean, some, some scholars like like Peter van Ham was was one of the first uh, people to write about this uh, more than a decade ago for Foreign Affairs, actually suggested this is something very positive. So you know, he said it's like state branding is supplanting nationalism. So it's the idea that the brand state is contributing greatly to the pacification of Europe. So the idea is that this kind of the fact that states have to brand themselves um, makes them more likely to have a more positive view uh, of, I guess, uh, everything. Um, no, I'm, 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 being, I'm being cynical here, but what, I'm, what the argument there is that by sell, having to sell yourself, you have to, in a certain way, change your, your, your in a sort of self-perception because uh, you cannot sell yourself as, uh, you know, warmongering or hateful or resentful or stereotypical or, or as, you know, 
indulging in stereotypes. So the idea is in a very much kind of a liberal argument that commercialization of national identity leads to moderation of national identity. Um, then scholars, I mean, especially uh, Nadia Kanova, who's worked extensively on nation branding, particularly in Bulgaria, but also in other cases, um, has argued that you know because it is um, commercial uh, and co you know commodified, it's fundamentally uh, creates some kind of national identity light, right? Because you know you define national identity in like one minute or two minutes, three minutes in one slogan. Uh, how how you know how much can it be uh, you know layered with all of this heavy uh, you know kind of uh, and potentially complex narratives uh, uh, as as kind of conventional nation uh, kind of national narratives, but. I would challenge this view. Um, I would say, of course, as you could see, these clips are banal and they are, they're reducing nation to the minimum. But at the same time, to say it's just nation identity, national identity light is downplaying. It is very condensed. You know, it's in many ways a very dense view of, of national identity because it takes, you know, it's like the concentrate of it because it tries to reduce it to, you know, one minute length. It doesn't mean that it's light necessarily. Um, So I would say that, you know, again, if you just take nation branding as one, the only expression of national identity, then of course you can say it's nation building or nation identity light. But I argue this is usually part of a wider landscape. It's, it's just the articulation, one articulation of nation building projects. So if you take it together with the conventional instruments from museums, maps, and censuses, um, it is something which actually uh, actually builds on it and adds another layer rather than, rather than um, make, replacing it. So it is nationalism in a new global marketplace. This is what I would argue. It, it, it tries to negotiate this. Um, there are tensions, and I think there are interesting tensions which, which for example, John and Jean uh, Komarov talk about in Ethnicity Inc. when they looked at the way in which the commodification of, ethnic, of the ethnic um, is uh, uh, discussed. So the idea of the kind of global obsession with ethnic art or you know kind of tribal art and you know the authentic uh, the authentic you know art of the primitive people right this is the this is the or music or you know and and so you, you have and this of course is a fundamental longing for something pre-modern um, which doesn't go well with modern nation state building now of course it can work in the sense that it might long for uh, you know national costumes or these kind of expressions of, of, of national identity which seem tribal or ethnic enough in this kind of global demand for, for, for the primitive, so to speak. But it can also, of course, create a tension because it also places value on diversity. It places value on, again, a very, a very, a very shallow and it's arguably a very particular vision of diversity, but it longs for ethnicity as this tribal but multiple identities, which of course does not coincide with the nation bad branding projects which often seek to present a unified nation rather than multiple ones. Um, although of course countries, different countries do differently with this challenge. So places, Montenegro for example has been more open in its tourist campaigns about mentioning its diversity and may, trying to make it a selling point. So it talks about the intertwining of various cultures and an authentic folk tradition. Um, so, of course, it can do it because it didn't have a war, so diversity is not intrinsically linked with, with conflict, so you can actually sell it. Uh, you know, in other countries, you, know, you wouldn't maybe be able to sell it. But you have challenges to the nation branding concept because you have no other places you can brand, right? So you have places which, which are locations which downplay the state. Take Medjugorje. If you look at international branding of Medjugorje, Medjugorje never mentions Bosnia and Herzegovina or hardly ever mentions it. When I was living in Vienna, well, in fact, 20 years ago, um, there, were, there was a flyer which came into my mailbox. This was 1994. Right? Visit Medjugorje, a former Austro-Hungarian crown land, to go to the pilgrimage site and pick some oranges in the Nevitba Delta. Now, if you remember what was going on in 1994, you know, this is not exactly what you would associate Activities in that area of going orange picking and uh, praying, you know, uh, in Medjugorje. But this is what went on. But again, this is an extreme example. But you continue seeing, you know, in campaigns about Medjugorje that this is not in Bosnia. Uh, it's either in its own place or maybe it's like very close to Croatia somewhere. 
So, um, so I, again, this is why you have these challenges to, to nation branding by place branding, where the nation is seen, I mean, the state is seen as an inconvenient, uh, inconvenient um, obstacle. Or you have region branding, right? So, you know, we're here in Istria, where Istria, uh, and, and where, where um, John Ashbrook, I think, talked about selling the, the Istrian goat a few years ago in an article. Um, uh, and, of course, you have very strong region branding, or uh, a colleague from Romania was pointing out to me that some, uh, you know, some tourist campaigns advertise Transylvania over Romania um, because, again, or airlines say, you know, we're flying to Transylvania because that has a positive or so, or it has a rich association with, uh, you know, I don't know, Dracula or with, uh, or people more enlightened maybe with more than that, while Romania has often more negative association. So you avoid the state. Uh, so you have these projects which at least indirectly subvert it. Or you have branding from below. So you have these grassroots initiatives which try to build up an alternative to the national narrative which might actually replace it. Or in the case of Bosnia, because there isn't a strong nation brand, might actually be, become the, 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 the surrogate for it. So you know, the Bosnian pyramids, of course, is one of those attempts to brand Bosnia, which you know, we all know is rather silly, but uh, it has some, it has some, some, some travels a certain way. And, and that's, I think, the key point of what, which uh, you know, I kind of want to make, keep making is, it, selling a product creates legitimacy if the product is sold, right? So a brand is accepted because it sells. So it also means that if a nation brand sells, it becomes legitimate. So it's a, it's a way to legitimize nation building because if you sell it, then if you challenge people, then you say, well, but it, it's bought. So if, if people buy the product, how can you challenge the narrative? So, you know, if enough people buy the Bosnian pyramids, why shouldn't it be true? Or, um, you know, uh, the case of Macedonia, of course, I'll come to in a second. Um, so, there is, this is, you know, the kind of last uh, conceptual point. Uh, it's again, it's about making it a product, competing with other products. Again, the, the competition is other nations, right? So there's a global marketplace of other nations, and you have to be better than the others um, in selling yourself. Um, you have to confront, the, you know, you can't sell a nation in contrast with one's own self-perception, but you have to negotiate global expectations with your own self-perception. Um, and again, I think nation money creates the hegem hegemony of one narrative, because again, it has to be simple. So actually the simplicity, the light element, forces, imposes one narrative over multiple narratives in those cases. One way in which, you know, is the country defined by churches or not? Or by nature or churches? Uh, you know, in some of the, very few of the clips, you see cities. It's very striking. You see countryside, you see historical monuments, you don't see, city, you don't see cities overall, except for, you know, pretty few places. And you don't see people except for, you know, kind of, People, you don't see larger groups of people. They are they are left out, and that's in fact a long pattern. If you look at travel guides, uh, travel narratives, most of them never mention people. I mean, they they talk about places and buildings, but people are kind of always a little bit absent. Um, now I'll come um, to, to the, the, the case in Macedonia, which I'll conclude shortly. This one to show you um, the the clip uh, from Macedonia.
arguably, uh, there, there are longer variants of that they don't What is, it's actually one of the few clips which actually has quite a few people in it. It's interesting, of, of all the tourist uh, promotion. But I think what is more striking about this is, is a couple of points. Um, it has also the kind of, you know, kind of side, of course, you know, of course you can, you know, drive a, a motorboat on a lake with a beautiful woman, and that, that kind of is a required part of most of the clips. But, um, but the most, uh, the kind of strongest messages there is that most of the Macedonians are dressed in traditional costumes. Um, they dress in folk costumes, and if you go to Macedonia, that's really hard to find for the most part. Um, but of course, it's also that the history and the present converge, right? You know, the, his the whole image is, you know, the people are, the present and the past are kind of very much interchangeable, and they kind of blur into one another. So it's a little bit like time travel, as, as the slogan also suggests. So, um, it brings in this, this dimension of tourism as time travel, uh, which again, it, it also seems to con confirm all the kind of Balkanist stereotypes of, you know, the way people dress, what they eat, how they, uh, you know, the, the, the houses and so on. Um, it's, of course, it's made by the director of Before the Rain, so it's like the same, uh, he, he actually made this, which is, you know, it's a fairly well-produced clip in terms of having a professional movie director making it. Um, Antiquity, of course, comes in. I think this is one of the interesting things where you see, you know, the convergence of tourist message as well as the message of uh, the new, new nation national narrative, which is again the one about antiquity. And of course, currently the government or the government is trying to con to convert the capital into looking like the stage of the video clip. Right? That's essentially what we're what we're talking about. Um, but again, the music is uh, ethnic. The atmosphere is mythical and fairy tale. So this is where you get, you know, certain way this kind of um, uh, ethnic element, but so this is you know, this is the clever side of it. But what is I think interesting is that you find also the tourist materials. I was looking at the Macedonian tourist materials to a great extent. I was also thinking that you also get the nation branding, which is a little bit sometimes unprofessional. So it's kind of indicative that there's like this huge long history uh, text, which I think you know just is like so turns off any tourist to read through this, and it talks about you know. Archaeological evidence shows that old European civilization acquired Macedonia between 7,000 and 3,500 BC. The ancient Macedonians were a distinct nation, ethnically, linguistically, and culturally different from their neighbors. In you know, parentheses, they should have said Greeks. The origins of the Macedonians are in the ancient Brigian substratum, which occupied the whole. You know, I, mean, I think most 99.9% .9 of the tourists are lost at this particular, at the at the Brigian substratum of the uh, ethnos. You know. So, so I think this is, I think, a nice example where um, it's also interesting how it kind of skips from 725 BC to 1913, but that's, you know, that's kind of about historical narratives. Um, but it's also interesting to see this kind of, this I think highlights the tension between the domestic need for producing national narratives and of course the global demand not for that, right? You want the ethnic and the exotic and the ancient, but you don't want the Brigian substratum uh, uh, explained to you. And, and so there's this. So this is not a, this is not a relationship uh, which is without its tensions. Um, the other element is about also the use of tourism for domestic discipline, uh, and this is a campaign which was launched by the Macedonian government uh, about um, called "You Are the Face, of, You Are the Face of Your Country," telling Macedonians how to behave towards tourists. This is about the Macedonians themselves. <laughs> Thank you. 
And again, this is a similar example to what I was giving you earlier from the Yugoslav time, the idea of kind of using tourism as a way to uh, you know, educate the people, to say, you know, this is not how you should present yourself uh, to the tourists, but in a certain way also suggesting certain norms. Um, and we can have a whole debate about, the, you know, the supposed Europeanization of the, pop of the population with that. I mean, and it's interesting in Macedonia, there's a whole pattern of a government releasing educational videos for its citizens. So they just released one about how one should take pills, for example, just the other week. Which I, I talked to a, psycho, a, a psychiatrist the other day who, who said, you know, this is, you know, uh, now, now that they've, they've messed it up, a good time to tell us how to take the pills to like, you know, uh, endure the government. But that's, uh, that's a, a, different, a different issue. Um, and I would say there's a certain kind of irony there that uh, you can have like the, 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 the id, which is the, the vulgar primitive self in the, in the video of the tourists are being ripped apart in situations like this. Um, the ego, the reality of Macedonia, and the super ego, the dream. Um, this is a description for tourists, right? So this is not, you know, so, so domestically they say tourists are ripped apart by the Macedonian market wife or the taxi drivers. The tourist brochure says, as a summary, Macedonians are very polite, warm, and positive people, which are really happy to have uh, and to welcome guests in their home apartments in their country. So, what are you waiting for, right? So, this this is the the, the same you know the same government, the same campaign, which just told the Macedonians that they are barbarians to their tourists, telling now to the tourists that Macedonians are wonderful, welcoming. Right? But this is again showing you this uh, this kind of self tension, this tension in, in how one constructs one's own one's own Im image. Um, and um, I'm going to uh, wrap up um, with a few concluding observations um, uh, about the idea that brand loyalty is an important concept, the idea that you remain loyal to a brand. Nation branding suggests that citizens should be loyal to their brand of the nation. They are self-disciplining, kind of disciplining videos showing how they should behave. But there's also the idea of nation branding, of course, that you accept the brand. You know, and that the brand has a commercial logic which uh, has an interest to be preserved, which is not just a logic about a particular national discord, but it's about a commercial enterprise. So if you're saying timeless Macedonia is a historical lie or manipulation, in fact, you are not a you know, traitor, but you're also destroying a brand. Uh, and so uh, what becomes a dispute over nation building becomes also uh, challenging a commercial enterprise and becomes more difficult, arguably, to be challenged. So it's a new way of, of establishing hegemony of a, of a particular way of looking at the nation. So I would argue this is why nation branding is not nation building light, but in fact it can be more dominant because it combines commercial logic with national logic. So it can be mutually reinforcing. Um, of course, the tensions I've highlighted between the domestic and perceived need of communicating a complicated and long historical narrative with a consumer reality where a tourist you know, wants to read the history of the country on one page and certainly not uh, in great detail about genetic origins and, uh, and, and all of those details. Um, they are the, the unintended consequence of tourism and the question of whether branding actually works and whether timeless Macedonia attracted any tourists or most tourists come to see the freak show of antiquity rather than the, than the, the genuine antiquity which Macedonia has to offer. And the final point is of course whether or not um, these kind of nation image, nation branding processes which try to define the nations in a global marketplace in fact end up not just creating what somebody has described as cookie cutter nations, uh, which on the, in the perception of the outsider look all the same, whether Bulgaria or Romania or Serbia or in Macedonia, there are all these Balkan nations which have churches and mountains and people skiing and food, and the, that there, there is this very little to distinguish them, and that in fact this whole nation branding in fact creates self-perceived importance and globally perceived irrelevance or at least interchangeably, inter interchangeability which, of course, is well reflected in the fake tourist guide called Moldania, which, you know, if you've ever seen that, is uh, quite an inter entertaining read of bul Balkanist stereotypes, of course. But, so in that sense, they might actually end up contributing to it. But, um, so, I'll finish with this. Thank you.
thank you for this wonderful lecture and we have uh, up to 30 minutes if you want for this session, 15 at least, but, but, but even more. So, and I, on popular demand I can always throw some more video clips. Of <laughs> Yeah, sure, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah hi, uh, I thought it was a really good presentation, it was very interesting. I mean, I'm just kind of wondering to what extent you think the observations you've made about sort of national identity and conservation, reducing everything to this kind of, you know, standardised model, you know, applies to, for example, countries in West Britain. So I think about the UK where our government actually refers to the country Grand Britain, and they, they had a survey to say what the people think of British values, and people said, Tea drinking, queuing, uh, being open minded, liberal free speech, bad teeth. Well, they, they didn't say the last bad teeth, but, but that's probably true. Um, and, and you know, most of those observations could apply to any country in Europe. And then when you see the kind of videos that. Queuing, uh, definitely not. They're not. <laughs> bad teeth and tea drinking, that, that's British, but the other stuff about so, yeah, We didn't mention things like colonialism or you know, that kind of thing, um, or Thatcherism, because that's, that's kind of a real problem. And then you look at the kind of videos, and it, again, it, it, it's stuff like the royal family. Yeah. Some uh, some uh, palaces somewhere, uh, some coastline, and so I, I'm kind of wondering to what extent you think that that's you know typical, pretty much to all countries in terms of the way they brand themselves. So there's something quite mm -hmm. generic about branding. And the other question, very quick question, was you know there's that saying that nothing kills a bad for like good advertising. I mean, apart from the kind of sort of fiasco one that they seem to get just about everything wrong. Like, kind of there are any other sort of ones that you come across that you think you can kind of backfire. Um, because somebody said that, like the young European sounds very positive, but in certain contexts it, it could. Uh, I know that if you want to be 92, whenever there's a story about you know a cemetery being uh, vandalised in Kosovo, or you know there's police doing something bad, or there's some corruption thing in Kosovo, so there's all these very ironic mm -hmm. kind of things. Like, ah, you see the young Europeans, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of yeah. nationalistic, but, but it's just interesting the way people mm -hmm. sort of use those slogans as a way of you know denigrating yeah. Kosovo. And, no, I mean, I think I would agree with you that, that I mean, the whole you know, nation branding comes from, you know, of course, the Western, you know, the concept and countries have used it. Uh, uh, and I, I think that it's, they certainly are, you know, because they are packed in one minute video clips or, or equivalent in whatever communication advertisements, they are simplistic and they're always, you know, reducing it to the banal and the recognizable. Um, so you can say again, I mean, you can say, you know, what's wrong with Britain presenting itself as, you know, the Queen and Corgis and, I don't know, a double-decker bus and, and all of that. I mean, there's nothing in inherently problematic about that. Um, I think what, I mean, I guess what it, what it, it reinforces stereotypes, that's one thing it does. Um, and I think one has to then look at the content. So some campaigns you can say are just banal and some have a particular political narrative they propose. I mean, the Macedonian one has a narrative, it suggests, I think, of antiquity, and, uh, which other ones, Montenegrin one, for example, is just, I mean, forgettable, but, but nothing, there's nothing problematic about it. So I would, I would differentiate that. But I think it's also interesting, and again, you can look at the whole way which you know, Austria is presenting itself very much in the, in the sound of music kind of uh, uh, logic, which you know, is, very problematic if you think about the fact that you know you have this kind of anti-Nazi resistance fighters, you know, defending Austria from 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 German occupation, which of course you know if you know any history of Austria, this is uh, rather exceptional for the most part. Um, so so I think you you know then that, that's when you get that's when it gets to be problematic or you know w and of course you know the inherent point is of branding is you know it's about positive image right so because you know we stand up by our imperial legacy and oppression of other people I mean you know this is of, of course you wouldn't do that so 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 that, that I think that's not inherently a problem but it's, it just means that of course the question is how much then it feeds back into one's own self perception and, and I think into the point of the, the brand is something you do not, you know, it's something you don't criticize, right? That, the, that idea that, you know, if you go out and say, you know, actually we don't drink tea, you know, how much are you not just engaging in a domestic debate, but are you yeah. threatening a brand, right? So, so and I think that's, that, that sometimes you get this resonance of saying, you know, you cannot challenge that because that's actually part of, yeah. of, of our brand. Yeah. Um, just, just, just the reason I mentioned that is because we have a, we've had a general election and, and you know, and you know, people accuse him very much of playing on things like fear of foreigners and 
you know, anti-EU rhetoric. And I'm wondering if, if the political context in your country moves in a certain direction, can that actually make, in your opinion, make an effort that seems very banal, very inoffensive, actually become something slightly more problematic? Right. I don't know whether it's... Well, I mean, I think, you know, as any, as any product, uh, as any kind of, you know, material product which manifests somebody's perception of what the nation looks like. It's both a manifestation, it can be read in a certain way as a, as a, as a reflection of, of a particular self-understanding, or at least a self-understanding reflected through advertising agencies, all kinds of you know, lenses, yeah. uh, and so it can be read as that. And I think so you can look at it as a product and can see about how, what came, came into it, and, um, and, oh, and the other way around is like, look, what, is, what does it do? I mean, how does it shape the debate as well? And I would look at it as both. Um, the second question you asked about the backfiring part of it. Um, now, I think, I think for the most part, they're just, I, I think there's a general overestimation of the influence. And I think scholars have challenged the fact that these spots actually have much impact at all on global tourism. That, in fact, very few people go to Georgia because Georgia starts advertising on CNN. I mean, there are, there, there are lots of other channels which act as correctives, and the fact that you see a good clip about Montenegro is unlikely to change your, you know, your willingness to go to Montenegro. I mean, I think the, the Young European Club is actually one which is, I would consider to be very successful. Um, again, because, not because it's good or bad. didn't try to get people to, to, to go to Kosovo. Maybe that's one way to, like, maybe that was like why it was successful, because it wasn't. <coughs> Romanian castle uh, and the wrong music strikes me as something out of 
we are. Are these projections of the nation by international advertising agencies? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think the answer is this means. Um, there are some cases. There's always a significant domestic involvement in the process. So, um, because usually they are, the, the video clips are part of a larger parcel of, of measures, right? So they usually, there's usually the tourist organization which determine the slogan, which uh, you know, usually run it through an advertisement company and then develop a whole package. So usually just the, the, the video clip is just the kind of the most visible part of a broader campaign which includes you know, brochures which then the tourist agency uses at tourist fairs and are distributed. Um, and it depends, of course, the, from country to country to the complexity and the degree to which this is organized. Um, you're absolutely right that there is a significant involvement in most of the campaigns by foreign advertisement agencies. So, you know, the Young Europeans was done by a foreign advertisement agency. Um, but there is always a domestic feedback. I mean, you know, I think they're not, they usually, as far as I know, and some other researchers have done interviews, uh, you know, there, there is a consulting process. And often, uh, there, in most cases, there's a partner agency in the country itself, and there's some kind of, because these are important on the national political level, there's some kind of veto or, or, or inclusion of government officials in this. So, so yes, there's an external, and this is this tension, there's the external demand which the advertisement agencies know and they say, we need, you know, women in, in swimsuits, beaches, and a little bit of a little bit of culture. Um, don't make it too much. Uh, as the external kind of demand or the kind of articulation, of what goes, and the domestic needs, we're saying, but we want to tell the world that, you know, we are so old, or we are, you know, we have that. And I think these campaigns, where you see them being negotiated. And of course, it's partly a function of the strength of the, you know, who is, who is more influential, the advertising agency or the, the national government. But, it's, but I think that that reflects the general tension between how to fit this nation project into the larger global landscape. Yeah. And all the other examples are from small countries, small nations. And you, in, in, in your very interesting presentation and in your project you put it forward, like how is there a difference between large nations and small nations in this respect? I think some others in the US have no national to report. I think now there is one which supports your argument. Mm -hmm. um, but in many I, I, I can see many Canadians going I don't know Canadian and many Canadians can go to Las Vegas, they don't go to the US, they go to Las Vegas it's yeah. advertising a site like nice Las Vegas or New York as a city has yeah. money to um, to uh, promote this institution that grow and very much along the lines of international marketing agencies. So is there is there is there a need for a small nation to do that more than more so than well, I guess, I mean, it, it, as you rightly said, I mean, the U.S. is exceptional as one of the very few countries which for a long time had no national tourist agency or board. Most countries have one um, or was not part of the, the, the World Tourism Organization, which in fact has its executive meeting in, in Robin, I think, today or just had it. So it's really... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you can see it, there, there, was, there were all kinds of discussions of why the U.S. doesn't have one. I mean, there's a... There's been arguments um, that, you know, it was, it was of course, they, there were efforts to build one up. A lot of them were, like, during the Reagan era, there was a lot of uh, tuning down of, the, of those efforts. Um, so of course, because you have a strong tradition of states which, are able, which do promote tourism, so, so individual states have also branding, right? I mean, in the U.S., I mean, even with the license plates, you know, Virginia's for lovers or whatever else, you know, they're, they're, they're very much part of that. Um, and so a lot of the branding happens on the level of, of states. And then, of course, in terms of tourism, on the level of cities, uh, whether it's New York or Las Vegas or the big, the big cities which advertise by themselves. And of course, I think it also gets more difficult to sell a country of the size of the United States because it is so many different things, right? So it's, not, it's even harder to capture in one minute slots. But I think other countries like France, for example, have a very strong tourist, national tourist organization which campaigns and which sells the country. Uh, maybe more subtly than through CNN spots, because that's not, you don't you don't need to tell the world that France exists, right? So oh, the Eiffel Tower exists. So, uh, but but they have other ways. But but there you find a very, you know, very, and lot, I think a lot of countries actually model them their national tourist agencies on the French model, which is quite successful in doing that. So I wouldn't say its size. It's, of course the strategies will differ, right? Because you know. 
country like France will not sell France, it will sell, sell like, I don't know, Wineland or Bordeaux or, or Côte d'Azur, because again, people will not go to France as a country. But I think uh, smaller countries will sell themselves as one package, you know, where everything, because uh, people will not care that there is, I don't know, a, a skiing region and another one. I mean, there's, there's not enough material to make it uh, a story, uh, which, uh, uh, which is, I think, uh, a key difference uh, in that case. Um, but I think a, a lot of this, the way in which these nation branding has been occurring in post-communist Europe, in particular in former Yugoslavia, uh, successor states, is in fact not been very successful. I think it's been actually a very kind of, it's been because it was driven a lot by domestic need rather than by global, let's say maybe global market research, uh, but, it's, but because this whole idea of positioning oneself as a nation was, was so seen as being more important maybe than, than the, the tourism product. And again, maybe it's successful in that sense. Maybe, you know, Macedonia doesn't want to get tourists. It just wants to be recognized as being Macedonia, right? So, I mean, again, each of these campaigns of, often have these dual functions. So it's hard to assess what is more important, the tourists coming or the, the sense that one defines one's place um, by doing so. I have uh, two questions. First is, uh, as you said, uh, these spots serve a domestic need more than a, than a global brand need, global commercial need. So are producers of these, these spots aware of that? Uh, do they know that they're actually creating a, a national, a, a postmodern national identity of sorts and not really attracting tourists? And my second question is, since you, I know that you, you teach at CEU, so you're probably aware of this, have you noticed that those, uh, those uh, signs that they have on cars depicting greater Hungary? Because we, we get a lot of Hungarian tourists here, and uh, this is uh, also a sort of projection or fixation with a very traumatic past, the Pia and all that, and it's tourists who are broadcasting their national, well, complex, I guess, to all the countries that they visit. Mm -hmm. What is your opinion on that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I, I haven't done interviews with the with the directors. So I can't really tell you what what their expectation is. I, I I do think that there is the genuine sense that this is projecting the the country outside to the world. I, I don't I, I don't think I, I, would, I would believe that they're. I don't think they're motivated by domestic kind of construction of a national narrative. I mean, they're, they're reflecting it and they're doing it, but I don't think that that's their purpose uh, deliberately. Um, I think that in the example of the the flag is a very nice example of banal nationalism, or you know, maybe not so banal. Um, and I, uh, I haven't thought of the fact that, of course, you cross borders and you go to the places which are on the map, which you have on your sticker and uh, claim implicitly. Um, but um, but yeah, I guess I mean I guess it's this kind of interaction between inside and outside, which which is I think there's a lot of other examples one one, one could look at. So I mean I think. This inside-outside is an interesting dilemma. The other dilemma, or the other question, which I think is interesting, is the, the, the to linkage between kind of market forces and nation building. I think this is where where we get some interesting questions coming out from there, which I mean I, I don't want to. I'm not able to answer, but I think merit further investigation. I think there there's a dynamic going on which which goes beyond what we've conventionally studied in national studies. I think you wanted to ask. Us. That's right. It's a good point. I mean, it's certainly. That's why they do all the same. Yeah. 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 Because, yeah. because there is a similar image due to the similar background coming to that house. I think a lot of them is. Yeah. But I think it's 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 the way we would like to be seen by others. Oh, that's the first 
and and uh, yeah, absolutely. Right. We're not expecting to do it first, but we're getting first. Yeah. We're expecting French, Germans, right. Swedish, and then during the 70s, mm. the world, like all the Swedish, like the Swedish people are coming. Right, yeah, yeah. And there's always, you know, there's always the, the discussion. Yeah. You know, I was actually having a discussion today in, here in Pula with a woman at the, at the hairdresser, in fact, and she said, I saw a tourist coming. Yeah, there are some people here. Actually, they're not really tourists. You know, they're like they 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 come by bus and they're you know kind of from, you know, these places which don't don't really make them tourists. I mean, there's a whole interesting debate about you know the perception and I mean the narratives about who who is a real tourist, i.e., the desirable tourist, and who is the tourist who brings the you know the the the, 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 the cans and the you know. The, the, oh, yeah, no, I didn't want to go into like naming names here, but uh, but you know there's there, there's there's this certainly this discourse about who is a, who is a, who is a desirable and who is not a desirable. But it's interesting. There are some campaigns. There have been campaigns which have targeted specifically neighboring countries. So there was actually Croatia had a campaign in Serbia a few years ago, which was exactly about kind of I think uh, it wasn't kind of friends again, but it was something going in this direction. Yeah, yeah, but there was something even more specific which alerted, alluded to the to the difficulties. Are you? For your parents holidays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so there was that. Well, you know, maybe you don't need it. That's you know, you don't need it, right? So there's no campaign. I mean, the interesting questions also, I think, coming from like because, for example, there's a lot of tourism developing of Kosovo going to Albania now, right? That's a very major tourist destination. I think a lot of interesting elements, which somebody else might study, how tourism is a nation build, a function of nation building there, and how it's also marketed. I mean, if the, if patriotism is appealed to in the campaigns, I don't know. I'm just wondering that there's lots of interesting questions where I think. Again, if you think of tourism as a place also which is, you know, through which nations are built, um, then, you know, and not just about uh, fun and sea and all of that, but, uh, but which has other functions um, in different ways. I think then, you know, one, one, asks, interesting, one asks questions which, which we haven't maybe asked ourselves enough. I think you had a question. Your last question. <laughs> okay, I'll take three questions and then I'll answer them. And can we all do together that? All together in two minutes, okay, yes. It's not a question, it's more, mostly a remark, but just to make sure that uh, we distinguish the images that we are watching, even though we are into the domain of art from Mars. This is a state aesthetics. It has nothing to do with film, even though we are talking about these images as being films. No to Manchester that you mentioned surely knows what is it when he is doing something for the state and when he is doing film on his own. And that's not anything new in relation to these campaigns. Hollywood has been operating like this for years. And the contracts that the directors there are having seven years long, and they do seven films for the studio and one film for themselves. I mean, it's a pretty harsh environment to work with as an artist. Therefore, Manchesky, he wants to get the money for his films. He needs to be doing things like this. And in relation to Serbia as well, that campaign, who knows who has done it? Maybe somebody from Ministry of Information. It's unlikely to be an artist that is taking something like this under their CV. The same way with the message that you got on your phone from Macedonia, I'm sure that intellectuals no, from Macedonia would be embarrassed the same way as tourists when it arrives in their message uh, once the plane uh, lands, right? No, absolutely. I mean, my, you know, like I, I, I have enough friends uh, in, in, in the, who, who are, uh, you know, from Macedonia who exactly have tell me that. No, I mean, it's and this is why I'm not so much interested in who's the who's the produ who's the maker of it because it's not because it's not about it's not a project of artistic freedom, right? I mean, there is a clear, you know, there's a clear goal which is set to them. I mean, I think, I think the Macedonian spot is actually really well done. I mean, it's, it's as art, you know, that you can tell it's a professional director who, who made it, that Manchevsky made it is different from the quality of most of the other ones. I mean, we can critically analyze the content, but, it, you know, I think it's quite obvious that there was somebody who knows how to make a good short video there. Um, and absolutely, I mean, but this is why I'm not so interested in what motivates him. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure it's money, and I understand it. I know he's looking for money to make good films. So, this is not really something which I would, I would also judge 
on. I think that's not the, that's not the, it's not the issue. I mean, this is this is state and commercial discourses, right? The, very clearly, and not not a grassroots or bottom up or intellectual or artistic discourses about the nation. They look very different. I think there was a question. You had a question, and then yeah, last two, last two. I do both of you. at Romania, Bulgaria, but uh, I, 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 there, I'm not aware of any of such campaigns in, in, in the, in the post-Yugoslav countries. I mean, I've looked at, at them quite extensively, and I'm pretty sure there hasn't been this kind of ironic, uh, playful campaign. I mean, there was also the Romanian campaign, which was in response to the British ads uh, against, like there was the British ads, like, don't come to Britain, right? Uh, and then there was the Romanian counter campaign, which was, you know, kind of come, come, to, come to, come to Romania. Exactly. So, so, so there, there seems to be there seems to be a certain sense there seems to be a certain sense of humor in, in, in the Romanian uh, you know tourist uh, agency. Yeah. Uh, because you show us <coughs> some examples from the 1960s and 1970s, and I was going to ask you: Do you have some uh, impressions uh, or some data about the impressions of the Polish? Some years ago, I found in the Balkan tourist agents in Sofia a letter from the faithful member of the <coughs> German Communist Party who wrote to the agency after the summer that uh, he decided to go to the communist country because he was a faithful communist and not to go to fascist Spain. Uh, it was from the late 60s. Ah, yeah. But he was quite disappointed with the way he was received and so on. <laughs> I think I think I think the, the the ideological tourists were at least in Yugoslavia minority. I think <laughs> people had other motivations. Uh, no, I mean I, again, I think uh, Igor might know a lot more about this question than than I do. Uh, the other Igor is having Okay, so so in that sense, Foreign to Yugoslavia. So so maybe you should ask them off, uh, over over dinner but 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 i think you know there were very clear images of expectation for travel to yugoslavia was yugoslavia was supposed to be a place which was cheaper than the other countries that was a very clear image uh, which you know i remember when i was growing up you know in central europe that this was you know why you went to yugoslavia i don't think it was uh, people who went there wasn't weren't more communist than uh, well, plus, you know, the, the number of communists in most West European countries was not enough to really sustain the tourism industry in Yugoslavia or, or elsewhere. I mean, you certainly had people who had ideological affinities. I mean, that's, that's no doubt. But I don't think that made up any significant number of the tourists. <laughs> of different countries. So we have New Zealand without a particular identity becoming middle earth in all the means of public. Mm. And uh, there is now an obscure TV show made by Ray Rio, made in Croatia called The Game of Thrones. Uh, and the thing is that I have a number of friends from some countries which are in the West uh, who told me, oh, uh, it's King Sunday, or Croatia, it's Western. So my question now is that, is this influx, is this, uh, Cyprus is very, very similar commercials in a way killing the uniqueness of those. But I mean, is it kind to bring uh, the bringing of this message is kind of 
can the message we want to bring. So is this maybe the terror now that we are losing the identity totally, mention whatsoever, and becoming some kind of disnification? Well, I think, but I think this is, I think, the, the an interesting question. You know, what are people traveling for? And I think that there's a, you know, if you look at the way in which global travel industry has developed, um, it's increased. It's, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of the mass is not about the place, right? Uh, you know, what is the Baltics and, and, and the Baltics in Britain sold for is cheap, you know, stag nights and uh, and whatever hen nights, whatever they call them. So you know, cheap beer to get drunk. You know, this, this is this this is how it's sold, right? In many places by Ryanair or by so by, by so 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 or, or places are sold for what they what you can do there uh, rather than what they are. Um, and so I think that, but that is not a question of the branding. I think that's a question of tourism development. I mean, it's the same with the global cruise ship industry, which, you know, people are very detached from the place they visit in most countries, most places. They are, you know, they have a, they have a, they live in a bubble and then they occasionally are, you know, allowed to leave the bubble and then go quickly back into the comfort of, you know, the all you can eat buffets and, 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 uh, and what is this? I mean, I mean, of course, there's a lot of different ones, but this is, you know, the, the vast numbers of tourism go for that. And so it's all about, you know, a managed environment with a few experiences. And again, you know, what people know, people know Games of Thrones or they know, they know The Hobbit or whatever else. Or, so, so these become places which people want to experience. They don't want to experience New Zealand. They don't want to experience Dubrovnik. They want to experience the Game of Thrones. So, you know, but that's, the, that's creating uh, amusement parks. And then there are some places which are lucky, quote unquote, to look like one. And then they get the tourists. But uh, I, I don't think it's the problem of the marketing. It's the way in which you think the global tourism industry has been developing. In the, and the fact that the number of people who travel today is such a large number that it, it I think, re re reinforces this dynamic. But I think Igor is getting nervous, so I think we have to stop. <laughs>